Well, good morning. As Wayne said, we are in week four of a series entitled How to Have a Great Church Experience, because that's what we all want, right? We don't want to have a, no one's ever come and said, I hope this is terrible, right? No one ever gets in their car going, boy, I hope this is bad, because, you know, that, that would, everyone comes hoping that it's great, and, and whether it's great or not, I mean, that is up to your opinion as you, you leave, and, and oftentimes we, we all have them, right? We talk about them at lunch, what, what we thought was good, what we thought was bad, and, and we've been dealing with this whole idea of what is church supposed to be? And, and until we really understand what God intended the church to be, we're typically going to be defining it for ourselves, and so all of a sudden, for us to have a great church experience, it means something different to every one of us, and we've realized over the last few weeks that, that God was very specific when he spoke to the New Testament church. In fact, in the New Testament, 59 times there's direct statements towards the church on how they should be towards one another. So when the church gathers together, and we know that that is the church, it's not a building, it's God's people, that when the church gathers together, there's certain things that God says, this is what needs to take place in those moments. And he doesn't spend a whole lot of time sharing about when the offering is supposed to be taken or when communion is supposed to be held or when prayer is supposed to be done. I mean, those things are mentioned ever so slightly throughout the New Testament in regards to form and function of the church. But the greatest thing God was concerned about was not how we do things as much as what we do. And we realized over the last few weeks that there's very specific things that God has called us to do as the church. In fact, the first week we realized that the church is really called to do one thing, and that is love one another. If you look at our 59 statements, and that is on the back of your uh, sermon notes today in your bulletin, if you look on the back of there, you need reading glasses, uh, no matter how old you are, because those are tiny print, right? Um, But we had to fit them on there. So if you you, uh, look at that, love one another is by far and away the most stated things in the 59. I believe God really wanted us to get that one. In fact, I wanted to make sure he he wanted to make sure that we didn't miss that one. Like, like, oh, I didn't hear you. So he said it multiple times throughout the New Testament. Love one another. Love one another. And then he begins to define what that looks like very specifically in the rest of those statements. What does it mean to really love one another? Because even that phrase is up to our own opinion if we're not careful. And so God says, okay, I want you to love one another as I have loved you. And all of a sudden he raised the bar to a standard that was not possible without the Holy Spirit in our life. Last week we realized that, or the second week we realized rather that in order to have a great church experience, we have to have the right mindset. That, that our mindset has to be right when we're coming into gatherings of believers. That, that our mindset should not be that of being served as much as it should be that of being a servant. And in fact, Jesus modeled this himself. On the night before he would be betrayed and the night before he would go to the cross, he's, he's there with his disciples and he's taking the form of a servant by washing each individual disciple's feet. And then he says to them, as I have washed your feet, so you should also wash one another's feet. We take that very literally once a year as we take time to wash one another's feet in that Monday, Thursday service. But, but really this attitude of humility, this attitude of servanthood, we talked about what does it mean to serve one another in a local church context. And then last week we talked about something that, that it seemed to, to resonate with, with many folks, that, that we're called to encourage one another. And in fact, it's so easy to discourage one another. And, and we're going to touch on that next week, this, this idea that we we can point out the flaws in one another, and, and it's so easy to do that, but, but encouragement takes an extra effort, and it's not simply, uh, you know, giving affirmation to one another. It's not complimenting one another. Christian encouragement goes a lot deeper than that. It's not just saying, I love your hair, although that's great, and it's encouraging, and, it, and it's nice, but it, it's going deeper to the character of that person. It, it's, it's helping them to understand what it is about them that you see that's Christ-like, and, and not just being silent, but it's really speaking and vocalizing that to people. And we challenge one another to pick out people specifically last week and, and make an intentional effort to encourage them, and I hope you did. And if you didn't, that's okay. You can do that this week also and the next. In fact, last week we read the scripture that said, as long as it's called today, you should be encouraging one another. So every day is a new opportunity. 
Well, this morning I want to talk about a way in which we encourage that we often assume, but we don't always practice. And in fact, this is listed one time in our 59 times, and I think the reason why it's only listed once is because we see the church doing this often, and so it was almost assumed that, of course, you would do this. We don't even need to talk about this one because this is something you do because you realize the importance of it to a great degree. Long before you were the church, even when you were just a, a people and there was a God, this was one of those things that was just innately there that you knew you needed to do. And as a church, we have to do it as well. But yet, we see this morning in our text that it's called out specifically for the church. In fact, James, the brother of Jesus, he writes to those who would be listening. And he says this in James chapter 5, verse 16. Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. You see, I believe one of the greatest ways that we can encourage one another, and I wanted to, to just kind of keep going with that momentum from last week, that one of the greatest ways we can encourage one another when we gather together as a church is to pray for one another. And if you've ever had someone pray for you, you know that there's an encouragement that comes along with that. But there's something greater than just an encouragement because I think sometimes we can, we can take a little bit of, of a good thing and we can feel like, well, well that's, that's great. But there's so much more about that that could be had, and yet we only dance around the edges of it. And I think prayer is one of those things. I think prayer was one of those things in churches where, where we love to have people pray for us and we, we feel good in the moment and we think, man, that, that really helped me, you know, give me peace and it helped me, you know, just know that everyone's there. It was just very encouraging. But, but we often forget about the power behind the prayer. And, and God's people understood this to a great, great degree. And in fact, I believe the church around the world sometimes can understand it better than we can because there's, there's just this reliance upon God moving in their life that if God doesn't move, it's not going to happen. How many times have you prayed for something, but it also while you're praying, you were figuring out how you could make it happen yourself? Have you ever done that, right? Like, God, if you don't come through, I got you. You know, don't worry about it. It's, it's okay. We're going to pray about it because I think that's what we're supposed to do. But it's okay. We figured out how to make it happen. Do you know there are many churches throughout the world that if God doesn't do it, it doesn't happen. And there's many things in our life that if God doesn't do it, it's not going to happen. But yet we can treat it as though, you know, it's, it's a nice thing to do. It's an encouraging thing to do. But the scripture would say it's the most powerful thing that we can do when we gather together as the church is to pray for one another. The most powerful thing we can do. In fact, scripture would say that, that sometimes as, a, as believers that we have the resemblance of faith, but we lack the power therein. That we look very godly and we look very spiritual, but there's a power that's lacking and we know that it's lacking. And we desire for it and we long for it, but we've gotten so used to going without it that we just don't expect it any longer. And maybe that describes us today. Maybe that describes why maybe your church experience, you wouldn't call it a great church experience. It may be like, ah, it's okay. <laughs> it's an okay church experience. Or maybe even worse, it's just become a bad church experience because you just desire what you read about, but you just even wonder if that's possible any longer in our churches today. You know, I mean, is this what we're resigned to just to show up and to sit through a Protestant mass for an hour and then to leave and we'll see each other next week? Or is there something greater that God desires to do in our life? Is there something life-changing, life and life abundantly that God has planned for those who would call themselves believers in Jesus Christ? Is there something that, that God has desired for us that doesn't last just for an hour? Encouragement that doesn't just last for an hour? Or, or teaching that doesn't just last for an hour? But that's something that He wants to do in our lives on a daily basis from this point forward. Something that could truly give us joy no matter what the situation Something that could actually bring healing into our lives. Not, not just a, 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 you know, a physical healing, but a mental healing or a relational healing that God desires to be the healing factor in our life. What would that look like? We've been talking about that this week. What would it look like for the church to really be the church? What would it look like in our lives? If, I mean, if we just, I mean, when people said, how would you define church? We could only just say, great. I mean, it, it's just, it's amazing. 
I mean, I, just, I don't know how I could be without it because of what it does in my life. Well, this morning as we opened up our text, James is writing very boldly. If you've never read the book of James, I, I encourage you, the book of James is very short. In fact, some have, have uh, likened it to the, the book of Proverbs that reads very quickly and very to the point. If you've ever wondered as you're reading through the Bible, I don't understand what that means, I doubt you read the book of James because it's un, you know, likely that you've read the book of James and goes, I'm not quite sure what he's saying here. James was very bold. Right, And as the, as the brother of, of Christ and as one who was the head of the church in Jerusalem, one of the original uh, 12, you know, as, as we look at all of these type of things as the, the church was birthed in Acts, James would have, was a part of that leadership. And so when he saw a problem, he spoke to it directly. He didn't beat around the bush. He didn't hope that you got the reference. He made sure that you understood what he was talking about. And as we look at our text today in James chapter 5, you know, I've often preached this text from 13 on, but really it starts before. Because you understand why James is calling us to prayer as a people. And he's writing specifically to those Christians who had been dispersed throughout the land. And he says to them, I want to pick up in chapter 5 verse 7. James chapter 5 verse 7. He says, be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we consider blessed are those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. And above all, my brothers, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. Let your yes be yes and your no be no, or you will be condemned. Is any of you in trouble? He should pray. I want to stop right there because in my Bible, it separates that. Right? It separates what we've just talked about, and then it goes into prayer. And we, you know, we read this prayer of faith, and we start there in verse 13. And we, we fail to realize that, that James is talking about a whole list of issues here in the midst of his letters. And I don't know about you. I, I typically don't list my letters by chapter and verse. Right? I just write a letter. And the same would have been true of James. And he's writing to the church of those who've been dispersed. And because they've been dispersed, there's this uh, something about the church back then. I'm sure it's not true today. They got discouraged about their situation, right? We've ever been discouraged about our situation. And they begin to lack patience. Have you ever lacked patience? If so, say amen, right? I mean, they lacked patience. And James is saying, look, I want you to look at the prophets who came before us, how, how they just, they continued to minister with patience even though they didn't see the light at the end of the tunnel. All they knew is what God had called them to do and they continued to walk faithfully. I want you to be that way. And in fact, the temptation is going to be that as you begin to lack patience, you're going to get take matters into your own hands and then you're going to do something very foolish. You're going to try to make deals with God. Have you ever tried to make a deal with God? The deal with God goes something like this. God, if you'll do this, I promise from now on, I'll do this. That sounds familiar, doesn't it, right? Maybe, maybe it was at a test in high school. Maybe it was when you got caught doing what you weren't supposed to be doing. Maybe it was that moment where you've realized, you know what, there's no out for me here. God, unless you come through, this is not going to be good for me. So God, unless you do this, Lord, if you will do this. I promise, I promise I will do whatever it was that you promised God. You see, there was a way about the religious leaders of that day during Jesus' time. Jesus spoke about it when he talked about the covenants they would make between one another. That there was often covenants that they would make that, that they wouldn't simply let their yes be yes and their no be no. In fact, they had began to make these elaborate covenants so that if they chose to not fulfill it, they could find a way out. 
They were great lawyers of that day, right? You find the loophole in the midst of it, and you take advantage of that loophole. And, and they would begin to make these covenants that, that they could find a way out if they chose to not do it. And James is saying, look, don't do that way. Don't, don't let swear by any other name, but let your yes be yes and your no be no. Just be authentic and faithful to God. Don't try to look for these ways out. Don't try to bribe God. Don't try to take things into your own control. Just trust and have faith that he is working on your behalf. And then he follows it with this. That, look, if, if any one of you is in trouble, instead of trying to bribe God, instead of trying to make this covenant pact with God, instead of trying to figure it out yourself, instead of getting angry and grumbling against one another, look, if any of you is in trouble, here's what you should do. You should, you should pray. And that's when the church people would say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But he goes on and says, and is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Let him worship God. Let, let his worship, this, this attitude of prayer, this attitude of, of giving God glory. If, if, you're, if you're not in trouble and you're happy, just, just be that way. Just begin to worship and praise God. If any one of you is sick, he should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has sinned, he will be forgiven. He says, look, if you're sick in the church, then, then you don't have to be sick alone, that you should call the elders of the church, that there's this understanding of just coming underneath the authority and just the vulnerableness of the church and just stating your need. You know, sometimes it's just so hard for us to be real about where we really are because we, we, we just want to have the same persona. We want everyone to think that we're great. We want everyone to think that we have it together. We want everyone to think that our family is doing well because if it's not, then that's a reflection on me. And to be real about where I am or to be real about where my health is means I have to be authentic before others. And James says, look, if you want healing, though, you need to call the elders around. Have them anoint you with oil. That's why we do what we do on Sunday mornings. And that the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. And we struggle with verses like that because we've often prayed. And we don't feel as though people get well. Or we've often prayed and maybe it didn't go the way in which we were wanting it to go. Or we've, we've prayed and asked God and it just seemed like God didn't respond the way we wanted to. And, it, and it's as though, you know, the kid, you know, who, who stands at the vending machine, he puts his quarter in and he presses a button and nothing happens. And gets mad and presses it again. Nothing. <laughs> One last time, presses it. Nothing. Change return, no change. It's like, what are you doing here? This isn't the way this was set up. I put in my quarter. I press my, that shows you how old I am. I press the button. And then this thing is supposed to come out, right? I mean, I'm supposed to get something for what I've put into it. And when it doesn't come out, I get angry. And then my anger begins to take over. And what do we do? We hit the machine, don't we? We're going to make it. We're going to force it. And then we really start rocking it, right? I remember I was with my cousin one time, and, and I mean, he was just like, he was just so angry at the machine. I was like, dude, calm, calm down. He's like, no, no, no. It's, you know, he's just so mad at, at the machine, just rocking it back and forth. Rocking. And then he said, yeah, I, I've got it. And he starts reaching his hand up. I was like, dude, you're getting in trouble, right? I mean, someone's going to not realize you put a quarter in. And even if they do, I don't think that's the best way to do it. And, and uh, you know, it's just, but that's the attitude we get, especially when it comes to God. God, we did it your way. We prayed. Then we prayed again. And then we prayed again. And you didn't answer the way we wanted you to answer. So, God, we're mad at you. Even though we may not say that to others. But, Lord, that's the reality. And so I think sometimes we have to realize the God that we serve. And when we begin to misunderstand the God that we serve, it's so easy to get angry because we feel as though he's holding something back when, in fact, God may be being very merciful. Or may, he may be answering in ways that we could just never understand. And I don't say that lightly because there's prayers that I pray that I just really wish God would have answered in the way that I wanted him to answer, and yet he did not answer. And I know that's the case for many of us here today. 
but it doesn't mean that we don't pray and it doesn't mean that we don't believe. Verse 16, he says, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. I believe sometimes, not all the time, but I believe sometimes the the things that block our prayers is not God not wanting to answer. I believe it's the attitude of our hearts and the sinfulness that's there. And we don't like to listen to that because we like to push the blame onto something else or to someone else. But, but the reality is I think it's times in our life, again, not every time and not every situation, but come on, you and I both know that at times we have prayed for God to move when we know our heart was not right with God. And we know what our life was like in, in spite of what everyone else thought about where we were with God. And that's why James says, look, it's important for you to confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Why? Because the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. He doesn't just say the prayer of a man. He doesn't just say the prayer of a woman. He says the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. That there's something about the way in which we live our life that affects the power of our prayers. And I believe at times in our churches, and I believe at times in my own life, that my prayers have not been effective, not because of the words I was saying, or not because I didn't put the right ending on my prayer, but because of the life that I was living while I was praying it. And then I act confused about why God hasn't healed, or I act confused about why God hasn't moved in my situation, or I act confused about why God hasn't answered the way I hoped that he would answer. And James says, look, you need to make sure to confess your sins to each other and to pray for each other to put on the righteousness of Christ so that your prayers may be powerful and effective. I I desire powerful and effective prayers. I think it's why some of us, we we, we ask certain people to pray for us because we feel like, you know what, I, I think you're a little bit more righteous than me. So I don't know if God would listen to my prayer, but I really think he may listen to your prayer. So would you pray for me? And church, we got to be clear that there's no one righteous except Christ and Christ alone. And that God desires to have his spirit dwell within all of us. And so God desires for all of us to be righteous and to have powerful and effective prayers. And if that's not you this morning, I believe that we first have to ask the Lord into our life and to confess our sins and ask him to be Lord of our life. But then as we daily walk this life, that we make sure that there's nothing in our life that's unlike him. And when we see it and when God reveals it, we confess it and we get rid of it. That's why James says, confess your sins to one another, that you may be healed. You know what? The world doesn't need a body of believers that gets together on Sundays and sings pretty. It needs people whose prayers are powerful and effective. It needs people who encourage others, not just with words and not just with with letters, but although those things are great and they're necessary, but those who encourage others with their prayer and who believe that when they pray for others, it's the greatest thing that they could ever do for someone else. Do we really believe that today? You know, as I was studying about this this week, I just came across a church in China, and, and the church in China, it seems that they gather together, and, and they don't have a lot of fanfare about what they do. In fact, many times they're meeting in secret, but as they gather together, one of the greatest things they look forward to is just the prayers of other believers, and they really believe that as others are praying for them in the church, that it's going to help them in the life in which they live. And I just think, what, what would happen in our churches today if we really believed that and grabbed onto that? I mean, would our prayer times just look differently? Would we, would we spend ten times less time wanting to, to hear the word of God and wanting to have others teach us and preach to us? Or would we just say, you know what, let's just pray that God would move. And let's open up our word and just pray that God would just show us what he desires for us to see. And, and let's just be the people of God. And when we know that we need power to do that. And so let, let's pray for, for God's spirit. Let's pray for his power to fall afresh and anew upon us. I mean, what would that look like in our churches today? In fact, the Apostle Paul, as he's writing in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 19 through 20, he says to this to the church of God in Ephesus, he says, pray also for me 
that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. This verse astounds me because I think if anyone would have the right to think, you know what, I've got this under control. Fearless? I don't need that in my life. I've got fearless. And boldly proclaim, I mean, have you not seen what I've been doing the last few years of my life? I boldly proclaim wherever I go. In fact, Paul would show us in his scripture that I've been beaten, I've been flogged, I've been shipwrecked. I mean, he goes on and on and on and on what he's done for the gospel. But even Paul realizes that unless you pray, there is no hope for me because I need the prayers of God's people as we do the work of God because we face a real enemy and that enemy would love to get me off track. So would you pray that I fearlessly make known the wonders and the mysteries of Jesus Christ? Would you pray that God gives me that boldness that when I stand up before others and speak that I'm not tempted to, to, to kind of water down the gospel for fear of offending someone or I'm not tempted to just make it a little let more appealing so that we can reach a broader audience, but I would just simply share it for what it is and hope that, that God will move in the lives of men and women that I would be fearless. And I think if Paul is asking for prayers, church, we need to ask for prayers from one another. I mean, when was the last time you asked someone to pray for you as you go into your work situation or as you go back into your family situation or as you move back, go back into that environment because you think, you know, I just, I want to be the person that God has called me to be, but I need the power of God in my life. Would you pray that that's present there? Would you intercede for me? Would you stand in the gap for me? Paul goes on in Colossians. Colossians chapter 4, verse 24. <laughs> 4, 2, 3, 4. There's no 4, 24. We're making stuff up. He says to the church of God in Colossae, he says, devote yourselves to prayer being watchful and thankful. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. It's evident that the reason why Paul was asking for prayers is because there was one mission to his life, and it was to make Jesus known. And I think sometimes in our churches today, the reason why we don't feel the need to ask others to pray is because we have no tendency to go and make him known. And so I don't need you to pray for something that I don't plan on doing. church as a church we're a part of God's kingdom as a part of God's kingdom we have a call upon our lives to go and make disciples of all men baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit teaching them to obey everything that he has commanded us and if that's our call then I don't know about you but that gets scary very quickly and overwhelming very quickly, and we feel <laughs> not up to the task very quickly, and we feel under-equipped very quickly, and so it should call us to gather together one another and say, you know what, we need to pray for one another, because if I'm supposed to do this, and if you're supposed to do this, we're going to need this power of God in our lives, because I don't know what to say. Remember what Paul said to the Christians who didn't know what to say? He said, don't worry about what to say, for at the proper time, God will give you the words. But you better believe they were praying before they left. That God, we, we need you to do that, right? What Paul said, we need that to take place in our lives because unless you give us the words, we don't know what to say. How many of you just don't know what to say? It's why I feel like we don't pray as much as, as, a, as a congregation. It's why I feel like we don't really intercede for others. We, don't, we just don't know what to say. 
God, what am I supposed to, I mean, I just don't feel like I'm that spiritual of a person. I just don't feel like I'm that qualified as a, as a believer to be interceding for others. So, so, Lord, we ask in the same manner of the disciples, God, teach us to pray. Lord, teach us to pray. Why they ask that? Because they served a Savior that they saw his prayers were powerful and effective. They saw one who could pray, and it just seemed like he was just, just communing with God. It was like it wasn't even a big deal to him to, to be able to spend hours and hours with the Father, and we get bored and we fall asleep after five minutes. God, I'm doing it wrong, I think. Lord, would you teach me to pray? We saw that when he would walk the streets, I mean, that, that people would just touch and they would be healed and, and that God each time would escape and he would pray before these moments. And they said, God, there's something about that. Jesus, would you teach us to pray? And church, I feel like if that's us this morning, Jesus has been asked that question before, so you're not going to offend him. If you don't know how to pray for others, then let your prayer be, God, teach me how to pray. Teach me how to pray. Lord, seek my heart. See if there's any offensive way in me. And then, God, God, just give me the words to say to someone. And in the awkwardness and in the, the embarrassment of just, like, walking up and asking if I could pray for someone or, or if someone asks you if anyone would like to pray and we all fall silent, why? We should be jumping to the opportunity to pray. That we have the opportunity to intercede for brothers and sisters in Christ. What a better honor than that. What a greater honor than that I can't think of. James is calling the church. Paul is calling the church. 1 Thessalonians 5.25, he simply says, you know, pray, pray for us. He kind of leaves it up to the people. Church, I mean, you, you just you kind of know where we're at. You know where we've been. Just, just, just pray for us. You know, as I look at James's word, he, he calls attention very interestingly to Elijah. He could have picked anybody, but he picks Elijah. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. How can I best describe powerful and effective? Let, let me talk to you about Elijah. And he's talking to an audience who would know exactly who Elijah was. But if you don't know who Elijah was, can I just share with you just a moment? Elijah was a prophet of God. Elijah's name meant Yahweh is my God or Jehovah is my God or, or my God is Jehovah. His name, his life meant that I serve a God, the one true God. And Elijah in 1 King, as a prophet of God, he, he begins to speak to Ahab, the king, and he, and he helps Ahab begin to understand where he's fallen astray as a king. You see, Ahab started his life worshiping God. He believed that all, God was also the one true God, but then he married a woman named Jezebel. And Jezebel had a different God that she served. She ser served the God of Baal. And, and Ahab, in the, in the manner of politics, began to say, you know what, that's okay. I mean, I've got my God, you've got your God. It's okay, we can both serve these gods. And in fact, we'll erect an altar to your God, and we'll also erect an altar to my God, and we'll let everyone know that, you know what, you can worship one God, or this God, or this God, or if you want to worship both gods, however you want to do, just worship the way you want to worship. And Elijah in 1 King, he uh, confronts Ahab, and he Let's him know because of Ahab's wickedness that the rain will, it will not rain for three and a half years. And it says in Scripture, and Jesus quotes this in, in Luke, that it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. And then Elijah spoke and the rain fell. Then because that didn't get the attention, Elijah calls the prophets of Baal to a challenge and they go up on, on the mountain and they say, okay, you know, we're going to build an altar to your God, I'll build an altar to my God and, and you worship yours and see if he can start your altar and I'll worship mine and see if he can light the fire. And famously the prophets of Baal cried out and cried out for hours and hours and hours cutting themselves and doing every despicable thing and their God did not answer. Why did their God did not answer? Because their God was not real. And Elijah prays a simple prayer. <laughs> Bella last week, she, she said, Dad, why do you pray so long? She said, you pray for like five minutes. Yeah. 
And as I was studying Elijah, I thought, maybe she's right. Maybe I need to cut it down a bit, right? Scripture says it's not by your many words that you'll be heard, but it's, it's by the lives that we live. And so Elijah prays a simple prayer, and as he prays the prayer, the lightning falls from heaven and not just burns, sets the altar on fire, it burns up the altar, it burns up all of the, the water they had poured on the altar, it born, burns up the stones that the altar's made of, burns up everything, and in one moment, there's no doubt, Elijah serves the true God. I don't know about you, but that's a powerful and effective prayer. James says that's the way our prayer should be. Our prayer should be like that of Elijah. But here's what he says of Elijah. Elijah Elijah was a man just like us. That phrase is used one other time in the Bible. It's when Peter and John healed someone at the temple gate, and, and all the people were amazed at the healing that had taken place, and they began to worship Peter and John because of the healing that had taken place. And they turn to the people and they say, men, men of wherever they were, why do you worship us as though it's something special? We're men just like you. There's nothing special in us. It's the God that we serve. It's the spirit that indwells us. And church, I believe that as a congregation that we have to not only go through the motion of prayer, but we have to once again believe what prayer can truly do. We have to not only ask for prayers in those moments where we know we need to ask for prayers, but we need to ask for prayers on a daily basis from one another because we have a call that's been placed before us in our life, and that's to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And as Paul, we should be praying for those open doors. As Paul, we should be praying that when those doors open, we actually have the boldness to step in. I was so challenged last week before... Tom left, and we're having this conversation with this young man, and, and we, had, um, we had been walking the track, and these, these four gentlemen, they said, hey, do you guys want to play basketball? They were four high school students. And we said, yeah, if you want two old, old white guys to play basketball with you, we'll be happy to play. And so we, we jumped on the court, and we started playing basketball, and we had a great time together. And as we're done, I said, guys, it's been great to meet you guys. My name is Jonathan. I pastor the Rock Creek Church of God. This is my brother-in-law, Tom. He doesn't matter. He's moving to Florida. And I said, but we'll, we'll talk to you later. And I turned and walked away, and, and Tom turned back around. He said, he said, guys, can I just leave you with one thing? And he shared with them the good news of Jesus Christ. And I thought, God, how long are you going to put up with me that I just see open doors and I don't walk through them? And I write us off as though you're going to give me another opportunity or, or maybe they'll ask a question. God, when you have the open door in front of you, just, just take a step in and see what God can do. No one bent on their knee and accepted Christ that day. But that wasn't the point for me. The point for me was that someone had the boldness to say, hey, guys, can I just tell you about Jesus before we go? Because we had a great time playing ball and life is great. But I just tell you, this is the most important thing. And it wasn't long. And it wasn't just this deep theological discussion. But it left them with something so much more than I'm a pastor at Rock Creek Church of God. How lame is that? So church, we need to pray for one another. We need to get serious about praying for one another. And if you don't think you're qualified, that's okay. You're in great company. But as a believer in Jesus Christ, Paul asked the church to pray. James asked the church to pray. I'm asking the church to pray for one another. If you guys start with somebody, start with me. I'd love to have your prayers. For boldness to walk through doors that are open. For doors to be open and for God to begin to do something within our midst. We need prayer within our church. You know, we, we sit in the, in the uh, a radius of six miles that has 26,000 people in it. And of this 26,000 people that we have in this six-mile radius, there's 6,000 of them that have, have said, you know what, we don't have a church home. We really, you know, not connected to any church. 6,000 people. And we're just going to worship and walk out like everything's fine. 
We're going to come to church on Wednesday and just act like you know, business as usual. But that God has placed us here for a specific moment in time. He's given us leadership in this community and the ability to, to spread the good news. And I believe, as Andy Stanton said, that leadership is stewardship and it's temporary. And we will be held responsible for what we do with it. And so church, if you don't think we need prayer, I want to encourage you. We need prayer. We need to pray for one another. And so this morning as we conclude and as we close, I want to encourage you today by, by praying for you. But I want to ask you to do this, that if, if you need prayer, Scripture says if you need prayer, you don't remain silent. You tell somebody and you ask for prayer. So if that's you today, if there's an area in your life that you pre need prayer for, maybe it's a sickness or maybe it's a relationship or, or maybe it's a sin, whatever it is, God is the answer. And so don't stay silent, but let the church be the church. And be encouraged this morning, not just by a, a word of encouragement, but by the prayers of God's people. And so I want us to close today in a little bit different fashion. I want us to close, and these altars are open. They're always open. And as we sing, you're welcome to come forward. And if you'd like someone to pray with you, you can raise your hand and you can do that. But here's what I also want to challenge you to do. That if there's a need in your life, just grab someone and say, hey, will you pray for me? And if someone grabs you and asks you to pray for you, don't freak out. Don't worry about what you're going to say. But just trust that God has appointed this time and he's going to give you the words. And it doesn't have to be eloquent. And it doesn't have to be fancy. Just genuinely pray for whatever it is that the need is and ask God to move because you can't do it, but God can. Church, that's the church we need. That's the church God intends. It's why he's commanded us to do it. Pray for one another. Let's stand this morning. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for today. Lord, we thank you for your word. And God, I just ask right now, as you're dealing with different people, Lord, that there's a need, a sin that's in our life. Lord, that if there's a sickness, a relationship difficulty, God, that people would not stay silent today, but Lord, that they would allow the church to be the church and to pray for them. And Lord, that they would just turn and ask someone to pray. And Lord, that we would be diligent and praying for others. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. The splendor of a king Clothed in majesty let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in a...